the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Today we celebrate the glorious feast of the elevation of the Holy Cross. And on this day, what I have to offer to you may not sound at all like it's related to the cross. And trust me when I tell you that it's all about the cross. We'll get there. We've been living in a uh, difficult time. There's been a pandemic that you all are very aware about that's gone around the world. And it's gone on so long that we're either just done with it or we're just sad that it's going on. But today, what I want to begin talking about, and I'm going to talk about it for the next several weeks, is another pandemic, something that actually is much more prevalent than even coronavirus. In fact, during the time of coronavirus, the incidence of this illness has gone up, estimates between 200 and 300 percent in the last six months. This disease has many names. It has ancient names that we're not very familiar with, typically. Uh, the modern name that we often call it is depression. In fact, it has a clinical name. There is clinical depression. And the modern world, in all of its best efforts, has tried to treat depression with very mixed success. And that's why I want to talk about depression and despondency for the next few weeks, because it's something that has affected so many of us. One in ten Americans has been diagnosed with some level of depression. And there are estimates that there are many times that many that have the symptoms, but either refuse to or just aren't interested in being diagnosed. There are all kinds of symptoms that go along with despondency and depression. I'll read just some of the mild ones. An ongoing irritability or anger. A generalized hopelessness. Overwhelming fears of guilt and despair. Occasional or constant self-loathing. A loss of interest in activities that one used to be interested in. Difficulties concentrating a lack of motivation, disinterest in socializing, and even physical aches and pains that seemingly have no direct physical cause. For some people, it affects them where they sleep too much, and some people can't sleep at all, or very little. The reason I want to talk about this is not just because it's such a common problem. It is actually more common than we perhaps all think. I want to talk about it because it's a dangerous condition. It's dangerous physically. There was a survey done just a few months ago, this past summer, 2020, and they surveyed teenagers across the country. One out of four teenagers surveyed this year, this summer, in the previous 30 days, contemplated suicide. So it's a widespread issue. But that's not the only reason I want to talk about it. I want to talk about it because it is a problem that we often call a psychological problem. And the answer is that it is actually, yes, a psychological problem. Only this world has forgotten what psychology is. Now, when I say to you word psychology, you hear the S first, right? What's the first letter in the word psychology? The P. The word pronounced properly according to the original language in Greek is psychology. And that psyche is not the mind. Psyche is the same word that we use for the spirit, the soul. When we have psychological problems, we have psychological problems of the soul, of the heart. It's a modern problem that we're becoming more aware of, but it's not just a modern problem. And that's why I do want to talk about it, because it is a spiritual illness as well, if not almost completely. And when we only treat a spiritual illness with 
modern psychology ignoring the soul, there's only so far we get with healing. So I want to talk about the origins of what we often call depression or despondency and find out what it really is, where it really comes from, and therefore how we can really get through it and be cured. The ancient word was uh, that they called this condition was, we pronounce it uh, modern days, acedia. The very common phrase in the writings of the early church fathers. Why was it so commonly used? Because it was a common problem even then. And not just for people who weren't all that faithful. It's not just about, do you have a strong faith? Acedia was a common problem among the most dedicated of monastics. Those that would go out, and only a few got this blessing, to go out and live their spiritual life truly alone, not in a community of other monastics, but hermits living out in the wilderness, sometimes in the caves. Those are the ones who were most often uh, attacked by this disease. The word acedia comes from the Greek akedia, and whenever you hear an ah in Greek, it means not. The kedia part is care. When you care, you have kedia. When you don't care, akadia, asedia, what we might call carelessness, but not in the word that way, way that we normally use carelessness, in the true meaning, we just don't care. And isn't that a common symptom of what we often modern day call depression? So if it's not principally a psychological mental illness, but primarily a psychological spiritual illness, where does it come from? And it's amazing. Over hundreds of years, more than a thousand years of the writers of the church writing about this disease, they always talk about, no matter what era they're from, the same causes. And I'm going to group them down into three categories. Actually, I'm going to quote to you from St. Seraphim. Where's St. Seraphim? There he is, up on your left. He was a Russian monk that lived in the late 1800s. He said very clearly, despondency is born of three things. Cowardice, idleness, and idle talk. Cowardice, idleness, idle talk. Now, we might think that, well, those aren't issues for me. By the time I'm done, if you think it's not an issue for you, let's talk, because it's an issue for all of us. You might think that cowardice, fear, isn't a problem for you. I think it's a problem for all of us. In fact, the more I think that we aren't beset by fear, the more we are fearing so much, we've gone past it into denial. If you don't think that we're a fearful people, Think about how we dealt with this coronavirus. Not just with prudent measures, wearing masks and all the things that are good to do in time of pandemic, but think of all of the fear globally, nationally, locally, familially, and personally. We have had, all of us, fear. Now, at some point you say, well, isn't fear reasonable? To a certain degree it is. God gave us the ability to think and to be aware of things that were threats so that we would react. That's why God gave us fear. But what have we done with that gift? We've taken that gift of awareness and we ride it so far that it becomes another disease, often more destructive than the primary causes of it. I was looking into statistics on, on burg burglaries because I hear a lot of people talking about fear in their homes, and so we're getting alarm systems. People are talking. They don't already. They're talking about getting guns, getting trained to use guns. You would think that we're in the Wild West. You would think that our homes are being rampaged one after the other. Now, burglaries happen, but they are so relatively rare compared to what? Compared to our fear. I learned something interesting. One out of three or one out of four people that burglarize our homes are known to us. 
So the image of the stranger who comes in and does, takes our stuff and is a threat to us in our place of safety, our home, it's not a myth, but it's really unlikely. But our fear tells us, oh, it could be any day. It's happening all the time. And so much of what we hear about in the news, because the news brings us the worst of everything, we think happens all the time in all places. And so our fear has gone through the roof. Fear of all kinds of things. Sometimes fear is for outside threats. Sometimes we fear inner things. We have anger that we somehow haven't been able to deal with and get over. And sometimes we're so afraid to face it, we bury it. That's something modern psychology has figured out is one of the causes of depression and despondency. So fear is all over the place. Idleness. Maybe you realize that you struggle with idleness. Maybe you don't realize that. We all do. And the proof is what we do with our time. We're sort of manic in our idleness. We either are shut down doing nothing, mindlessly watching episode after episode of TV shows that mostly don't give us really anything valuable, or we're manic in our energy. But to be calm, to sit and be silent, we do this with the kids at the camp, and you'd think sometimes in the beginning that we're torturing them. We say, we're just going to sit here, do nothing for five minutes, and be quiet. Now, after the five minutes, they find that, wow, there's really beauty in true silence and stillness. But idleness, when we are paralyzed sometimes by our busyness, is a problem that many of us face. Think of all the things we do to distract ourselves from just being. And we vacillate between hyperness and sometimes shutting down to the point where we just sleep. Now, the next one, again, if, this, if, if, this, if you don't think this affects you, I'm going to challenge you, and that is idle talk. Idle talk. I'll give you two words and see if you are a victim of idle talk. Social media. Anybody convicted? No? I'll give you two more words. Talk radio. Still didn't get you? Two more words. Cable news. Now, if you've escaped all three of those, perhaps I might believe that idle talk is not a problem for you, whether we're doing it or listening to it. Idle talk is idle talk. And here's the problem, not just with idle talk, but with all three of those conditions, cowardice, idleness, and idle talk. Often, how often do we look to those things as the solutions? That when we're not feeling well, we go to those things. When we're feeling a little bit down, we seek them out. And here's the wisdom of the church saying that all three of those are the causes of why we feel down. So, if you're still thinking maybe you're doing okay, it's time to take a despondency test. We're all going to get tested. Don't worry, I'm not going to stick anything up your nose, but we're going into your heart a little bit, so it might be just as uncomfortable. These are the symptoms that the fathers of the church talk about as some of the most prevalent symptoms of despondency or acedia. Now, you may not be afflicted with all of them, hopefully you're afflicted with none of them, but if you are, we want to find out. We want to know that, that you've got something to deal with. So as I read these off to you, describe them, I want you to rank in your head on a one to 10 scale. One meaning I hardly ever feel or think that. 10 meaning that happens a lot. Here they are. Number one, chronic sorrow or sadness. St. Seraphim, the same St. Seraphim that gave us the three uh, conditions of it, says, sorrow is a worm of the heart that gnaws at the mother that gave it birth. Gnaws at the heart. Now, there are times that all of us should be sad. We're talking about an overwhelming, ongoing sadness that seems to be more the default than the exception. Symptom number two, 
a reluctance or even inability to see the hand of God at work in everything. That's a tough one. Easy to see his hand in work. Perhaps when we come to church, we get inspired by the services and the prayers and the music and the icons. Maybe we see the hand of God at work when we're here in church or when we stop to pray. Do we see the hand of God in everything, even among and around the things that he doesn't want? Lots of things going on in the world that God doesn't want right now. Lots of hatred, lots of unrest, lots of illness, wildfires. That's not why God made this world. But his hand is there in the middle, especially with all those suffering, with those things and everything. So when we're reluctant or even unable to see the hand of God at work, it's a sign that perhaps we have a case of despondency. Number three, discontent. Just not being content, wanting something more, something different. Now, if you're thinking, well, that's not me, I don't care, that's the other side of discontent. When our discontent is so great, it just converts into an apathy, and we just don't care. Number four, placing high priority on comfort. This is a tricky one. Anything wrong with being comfortable? No, not necessarily in of itself. But when that becomes a high priority, we have to ask ourselves, why? Why do I seek comfort so often and so much? And the answer is obvious, that somewhere inside, often where I don't want to look, we have discomfort. And so when seeking comfort is a high priority, that's again a symptom that we have despondency. Now this last one, all of these have gotten me so far, by the way, I'll confess to you, all of these have gotten to me. This last one really got me. This last one convinced me I've got to deal with this. A reluctance or a disinterest in prayer. A reluctance or disinterest in prayer. Think of all the things we say to ourselves when we don't pray. Too busy, not enough time, wish I could, tomorrow. All those things we say to ourselves, the fathers for 2,000 years say, yeah, that's the excuse. That's the lie we tell ourselves. What they say is that when we are reluctant to pray or disinterested in prayer, it's a sign that we have a spiritual illness. And yes, prayer is part of the cure. We'll get to that in a few weeks on how we get around all of these symptoms that discourage us from doing the very things that we need. But when we are reluctant to pray or disinterested in prayer, it's a sign that we've got a case to some degree of despondency. For some of us, we have big bad cases. And for some of us, it's a problem, maybe not as big, but something we ought to deal with. So I'm not going to talk about the treatments today. We'll get to that. But I don't want you to leave hopeless. I want you to leave with a lot of hope. And two things I want to share with you. To the degree that we wrestle with our despondency and our depression, the things that we think cause it are not the causes. If you think that if the coronavirus went away, or all the conflict in the world go away, or the politics got better, or your marriage got better, or your relationship with your kids, your parents got better, if you think those things changing will bring you out of whatever depression you're suffering, it's not true. Now, why is that good news? The good news is we don't need anything to change. We want it to change. Nothing wrong with wanting things to get better or easier. But our despondency and our depression is not due to the conditions of our life. And we're going to figure out how to deal with those conditions in a much better way that don't bring us into despondency and depression. But the good news is we're not tied to it based on events and situations that we can't control. If that were the case, if our despondency was due to conditions, then what we heard in the gospel today would show us that the most depressed person that ever walked this planet had to be Jesus Christ. Betrayed by his followers, let alone his closest friends. Made to suffer in every way possible through his passion and his crucifixion. 
If suffering causes depression, Christ will be depressed. And we know he's not. He is the opposite of depression. He is not akedia. He is kedia. He cares. The proof of his care is going to the cross for us. That's how much he cares. And so the good news is that we are not stuck with our depression due to the situations around us. And the second hope I want to share with you is that this disease, as awful as it is, and it's an awful disease, and the more one is affected with it, the worse it gets. The good news is that we have the cure. The church has the cure. I'm not telling you ignore your counselor or your physician. Deal with the physical and psychological effects as well as you can. What I'm telling you is those are only going to take you so far. And who tells us that? The physicians themselves. They say our treatments, the best of our treatments, are moderately effective. But you know what's completely effective? The care, the care and the cure of Orthodox Christian faith. We've been curing this disease for 2,000 years. We're not waiting for a vaccine or a cure. It came two millennia ago. So the good news is we have the cure, and we're going to get into it in the next couple weeks. The world wants to solve this problem with all its power and its wisdom. And it's only going to be able to go so far. We heard about this today in the epistle. St. Paul says, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, and that's all of us, we are called. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The cross, Christ crucified, that's the solution. And we're going to get to very practical ways on how that is the case. But let me tell you that when we do that, we're going to end up where we began today. This is the feast of the elevation of the cross. This is going to be where we end up looking for the, sol the solution and salvation from this common problem. So stick with me. We're going to spend a couple weeks on this. If there are those that you think uh, could use this message, bring them with you or tell them to, to watch the live stream or watch the recordings, because I think this is a problem that has affected us far too long, and we in the church have held this secret far too deeply, and we're going to share it with everybody. I want to end my homily today in, in the way that I normally don't. I'm going to end it with a prayer. There is a prayer of St. Philaret of Moscow. This prayer is one we can pray every day. It's a prayer that we can pray when we don't know much. And that's why I chose this prayer to end my homily today. We don't know much. We don't know much about how this is really a problem for us or for those around us. And we often don't really know what to do about it. So I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to pray this prayer. And let this be our way of seeking God's help in defeating the despondency in our life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. O Lord, I do not know what to ask of you. You only know what I need. You love me more than I am capable of loving myself. O Father, give your servant that which I cannot even request. I dare ask for neither suffering nor blessing, but I stand before you with my heart open toward you. You see the needs which I do not know. Look upon me and act according to your mercy. Chasten and heal. Let me fall and get me up. I tremble and remain silent before your holy will and before your judgment which is beyond reach for me. I offer myself to you as a sacrifice. There is no desire in me except for the desire to fulfill your will. Teach me to pray. You yourself pray in me. Amen.